uh, also experienced symptoms like skin rash um, uh, that is also not typical. And uh, always good to have a thermometer at home cool. because this is the only way to actually measure cool. a temperature and um, conclude there is a fever or not. Uh, and a fever is defined as a temperature that is above 100.4 Fahrenheit or uh, 38 degrees Celsius. Uh, a person can also not have symptoms and uh, and the, the severity of each symptom can vary. The duration as well can vary. So a person can just have fever for a day or two, or, or the fever can last up to five days. It's, uh, it's really different for everyone. And uh, none of these in terms of severity or in terms of du the duration uh, can, can actually make us uh, be certain whether it is, a, it is COVID or not. The only way to be certain is to get tested. All right, so now if a, a person or a child has symptoms, the next step would be to test them immediately. So I have this algorithm that I've, um, uh, I got it from uh, CDC. Um, if a person has symptoms, um, any symptom that I've already mentioned in the, uh, in the previous slide, um, the easiest way or the fastest way to test is doing an antigen antigen test and uh, this test is um, uh, can, can yield rapid result within a few minutes uh, ideally 15 minutes of waiting and uh, usually the the kit in Indonesia uh, is available um, and it, it takes samples from uh, from the nostril area, and it is a, it is significantly sensitive if a person has symptoms. Uh, but uh, the interpretation will also you know have to um, it has to consider whether a person has been in close contact or if there there has been a known exposure or not. So. Uh, if, a, if a child or, or a person has symptoms and they do the antigen and it's positive, then most likely in this situation where COVID is rising up, then it's most likely they have COVID and they need to isolate. And if a person tests negative, but uh, there is obvious, um, uh, there is obvious contact uh, to someone who has uh, been tested positive or someone um, or, or if there is no exposure and they test negative with the PCR with no known exposure then do, then they do not need to quarantine. Uh, a positive PCR makes a person uh, to be a hundred percent most likely to have COVID. So there is no need for example to do another PCR to confirm this. A positive PCR already confirms this and a person just needs to isolate. But if you tested negative with PCR and you tested negative with antigen and you have been exposed to someone who was positive, then you need to quarantine or you need to stay at home and the duration will be explained later in a detailed manner. Um, it's important before uh, anything, uh, it's nice to, to, to have a plan, right, uh, depending where you live, uh, to know where uh, you can get tested in the safest way possible and in the most reliable way, of course, so you don't have to question uh, the result when it comes up. Uh, and it's also important when you're confused, talk to a doctor or um, a healthcare professional that you trust to get a reliable information in interpreting these results. Um, also, I get a lot of questions about CT values on PCR tests. Now, the CT values uh, in a setting where you are self-isolating at home and you're experiencing mild symptoms, then it's not of any clinical value. It means that we don't really look at the CT value um, and it should not affect how long you isolate or 
it should not be able to predict whether your symptoms will be severe or not. If a child has no symptoms, but he or she was exposed to someone who was positive, then uh, this algorithm applies only when the child has no symptoms and has been exposed. If, uh, uh, first of all, they can do an antigen test, but an antigen test is best taken on day five, which is five days after the last contact with someone who was positive. This is because there's an incubation period uh, and it's more effective um, to get tested uh, after five days to not get a false negative or a negative that should should have been a positive because uh, maybe we have not given the chance for the viral particles to multiply uh, in a person's body uh, and therefore the most ideal time is five days after the last contact during this five days a person needs to quarantine or stay at home because they are potentially contagious that's why they need to stay at home and uh antigen test can also be taken because it's a screening test if you are planning to go to a, to an event that is indoors just as a precautionary uh, measure yeah uh now if a person um, tests on day five and then um, they, they get a positive antigen, when the, when the positivity rate, like uh, what's happening right now, is high, we usually trust the antigen that is positive. And sometimes a person does not need to, to, to do a PCR to confirm this. We usually tell them to just isolate. But if a confirmatory test to, uh, is needed, depending on the situation, then a PCR can be done to confirm this. And if uh, a PCR is positive, then that is a definite um, infection, then a person needs to isolate. But if a PCR is negative without any exposure, then they do not need to quarantine. So, it really depends on whether there was a close contact or an exposure uh, to interpret the results of these tests. Right, now we uh, uh, continue to a uh, quarantine protocol. So a uh, quarantine is defined as a person who has been exposed or has uh, had a close contact but their infection status is not known because they have not tested yet. Uh, there are different uh, guidelines here, uh, whether a person should quarantine or not. For example, if uh, you have been exposed to someone who is positive and you have symptoms that I've uh, described before, then you should quarantine immediately and you need to test immediately with an antigen test but uh, uh, it uh, quarantine applies for people who are not vaccinated or their primary vaccination meaning you know if you've had a sinovac uh, first dose but you haven't really done the second dose in which you're due then you have incomplete vaccination then the protection is not maximum then a person in that case need to quarantine at least five days and then on day five they should get tested and if a person has done their uh, vaccination or have received their boosters the primary vaccination
to not be around people because you might uh, be infectious and you're waiting for the, the test result. Um, the newest guideline from the CDC uh, is described here. So the isolation, and this only applies to people who have mild symptoms that I've already um, previously discussed. Uh, the duration of isolation is five days and it is counted from day zero and this this day is when the uh, when when a person tests positive and they're asymptomatic or it can start from the day when you first had the symptom it can be difficult for children um, especially if your child is a baby uh, to determine uh, when was their first day uh, or when would be the first uh, day counted uh, to be uh, isolation of day one. Uh, in that case, it's better to uh, count from the day they have tested positive with an antigen or with a PCR. Um, and on day five, a person can end their isolation if they remain to be asymptomatic from day zero to day five they do not have symptoms, they can end their isolation without getting a test, without PCR or antigen to confirm this. Or if uh, during the five days isolation, they develop symptoms, for example, fever, and on day five, they need to be uh, having normal temperature for 24 hours without medication. And that's why during the isolation, it's very important to monitor your children's temperature at least twice a day to see if the fever is resolving or going away or not. And it needs to be going away without any medication like Panadol or Paracetamol to be able to be conclusive on whether it's safe enough for them to end their isolation or not. And a person cannot end their isolation if fever on day five is still ongoing or they develop severe symptoms. Severe symptoms include difficulty breathing, chest tightness, or uh, uh, losing their consciousness level, and in which very rare we, we have not encountered that uh, symptom uh, recently and uh, it's better to continue isolation until day 10 if your child is immunocompromised. Immunocompromised means they have other um, comorbidities or illnesses like cancer or uh, HIV infection um, or any other medical conditions. If you are in doubt about whether your child is immunocompromised, you need to uh, speak to a doctor about this. Uh, after they complete day five, it is advised strongly that they come out of the isolation still wearing a mask for another extra five days. So these five days of precaution, your children or yourself, you can meet other people, but you still need to be wearing a well-fitting mask. So being indoors with others without a mask is not recommended during this 10 days of um, isolation. Um, and it's also not recommended to travel until you finish your day 10 of isolation. It's also not recommended to meet people at high risk, for example, elderly people um, or people with comorbidities because it is likely that there are some viral particles that can still be transmitted when you're not wearing a mask. And you're lying. Uh, these people. Okay. Um, I would also like to highlight that after a person finishes their day 10 or their isolation, they do not need a negative PCR test or a neg negative antigen test to come back to school or to come back to work. Your PCR test or your antigen test likely can remain positive, especially PCR. So PCR is a very, very sensitive test. It is useful only to detect whether you are infected or not on day one. So it's useful to identify the infection, but it is not used to uh, conclude 
or to end someone's isolation, uh, it can still detect uh, viral particles that are not active or are remaining particles from the previous infection. Uh, and, and, you know, in that case, it can just say positive on your paper, but it just means that these viral particles are no longer active, especially when you, when you don't have symptoms anymore and you're recovering well. It's a different uh, situation uh, for people who, uh, who develop a severe illness. In that case, it, uh, the interpretation uh, will be uh, different. Uh, in any case, uh, generally children recover well, um, even without symptoms from day zero to day 10. Um, and, and upon returning to school, they do not uh, require a, another PCR or an antigen test. Now, uh, I get a lot of cases where um, uh, uh, their, uh, parents have tested negative uh, but their children tested positive because uh, uh, of transmission or getting infected at school. Uh, and some children, if they're already old enough to isolate on their own, then, uh, then they, the isolation protocol uh, for them applies uh, the same as with adults. So uh, they should be in a separate room um, with their own bathroom, eating in their own room for five days uh, and after five days uh, just like we've discussed after five days uh, they do not have fever anymore they can join you um, but not really eat together until they uh, finish day 10. but in children who are unable to isolate on their own for example for toddlers or for babies uh, in this case uh, they need to have at least one carer, one guardian, one adult to care for their child during the isolation, during the five days isolation. And this carer uh, should not be someone who is um, more than 50 or 60 years old, because that means they are at high risk um, of getting infected or getting severe symptoms. And it should be someone ideally with no comorbidities, uh, fully healthy uh, and um, uh, are able to take care of uh, the child. Um, during the isolation, this carer needs to monitor symptoms of the child, checking their temperature morning and evening. Uh, if needed, they should have to give a paracetamol, coughing medication or runny nose medication to
sodium if if they're not ur urinating more frequent uh, than usual or if the the volume of their urine has gone down significantly then they might be experiencing uh, dehydration and that also needs um, treatment uh, now i would like to address uh, some questions from parents about uh, whether it is safe or not right now uh, to be sending uh, your child to school. Now this uh, has to um, uh, consider different factors. Uh, every child um, have different uh, health uh, history, they have different uh, COVID vaccination status um, and that also this also depends on their age um, so first of all uh, because vaccination has been effective uh, in uh, uh, protecting uh, children and people from getting infected with COVID whatever the variant is and therefore it's important that you need to consider if your child has been uh, vaccinated or not so uh, children who have been fully vaccinated uh, are um, considered safe enough to attend offline um, learning. And uh, in Indonesia, uh, vaccination for COVID-19 now um, has uh, already been initiated starting from the age of uh, six. They can receive Sinovac already and it's still an ongoing um, program. So if your child is not vaccinated yet, please encourage them to do so as soon as possible as long as they do not have contraindications uh, such as allergies to certain materials of the vaccine or if uh, they have comorbidities uh, please uh, discuss with the pediatrician uh, about uh, any special conditions that they may have and um, discuss what preventive measures that are specific to their conditions for example like asthma Obesity is also a comorbidity uh, if your child has obesity and this needs a, a, a discussion with the doctor. And it's also important to consider whether uh, the family members of the child have been uh, vaccinated as well and the teachers at school uh, also need to have been vaccinated to consider that uh, uh, offline school uh, is safe for um, everyone. Um, one other important uh, factor to consider is how cooperative or um, if your child is able to uh, understand um, how important it is to uh, do physical distancing, uh, to always wear a mask or to um, keep their hands washed, always encourage them whenever they get to school to wash their hands first once they arrive they need to be um, cleaning the surface of their table and before they eat or um, after going to the toilet they need to be well rehearsed with uh, their hand hygiene and all so if you're ch if you're certain if you're confident that your child can follow all of that then that can also be deemed uh, safe enough for them uh, to attend school as a parent, uh, you also need to consider um, the school, uh, school's facility, how prepared they are when, uh, when a positive case uh, is identified. Uh, everywhere now around the world, um, schools are adjusting um, to, uh, to the trend of COVID case. Uh, sometimes it, they can close down entirely and return back to online learning, uh, which, is, uh, which is experienced massively in Jakarta. Um, and therefore, uh, uh, it's, uh, it, it, it should not be a, a concern because uh, these are uh, currently the standard protocol. And then once it's safe enough, the school can also uh, uh, can open again, maybe do a hybrid um learning uh, depending on whether it's already safe enough to do that or not um but ultimately uh it depends on uh, yourself as a parent uh you need to consider what's best for your child uh, everything needs to be uh, customized 
uh, because you know your child best uh, compared to the teachers and compared to the doctors. You need to you 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 can decide whether it's safer for them to be at home or not. Uh, but after knowing all the risks and knowing um, fully being fully aware of the information and the considerations. Other preventive measures that I, I can uh, recommend uh, is uh, the influenza vaccination. This has been uh, encouraged by the um, American Association, Association of Pediatricians uh, because, as I've said, symptoms of uh, common cold and COVID itself in children are, are pretty similar. You cannot differentiate whether you know they're having just flu or they're just having common cold or is it COVID. Um, so we cannot risk them having uh, these symptoms and uh, you can actually prevent them from getting common cold by, uh, by giving them influenza vaccination. An influenza vaccine is also encouraged for all staff and family members uh, to also reduce the chances of a person experiencing flu symptoms um, and therefore you know when, when, when they get sick or when they have fever from common cold that's reduced and they can um, they do not lose any uh, any time uh, learning and so this is the take-home message I, I hope my slides were clear but uh, if you joined in the middle or if it was uh, confusing uh, the take-home message would be please get your child uh, vaccinated especially when they're uh, already six years old and above and they have no clear contraindications the vaccinations are generally safe um, and this has been proven to be effective in protecting them from whatever variant of covid including the new variant omicron and um, it's uh it's also protective uh it's also proven that well-fitting masks and standard health protocols are effective as well in protecting us against the new variant and that uh after getting infected do, or if your child has been infected um you uh you do not need uh, to do another pcr when they finish their isolation um, generally, they can return back to school without uh, having to do another test, but it depends on their symptoms. And please recognize warning signs when to actually seek hospital care and when it is okay to stay at home. And in the end, uh, whether you want to um, uh, have your child learn from home or go to school, that ultimately uh, is uh, your decision as a parent to consider after all the information that I've uh, shared with you today. Okay, I think that's about it. Okay. Um, thank you, Dr. Karina. And that was really very informative, very sort of science driven, which I think is hugely important. You know, like, as mentioned before, there's so much different and conflicting information popping up in the media right now and it can sometimes be a little difficult to to filter and identify what the truth is and i think you've done a wonderful job of uh, of clarifying that for all of our guests here today what i'd My like pleasure. yeah what i'd like to do is um i'd like to i think i gave everybody access to this and we, we we got some sort of early questions from all of our guests before they joined today so i think i'd uh if it's okay with you i'd just like to this is what we call a kwl chart so can everybody see this on their screen at the moment yeah yeah all right great so K is sort of things that we already knew. What did we already know about the topic? And some people already submitted the things they knew. Want is all of the questions that people have, the questions that they're hoping to, to get addressed uh, today. And I think you've already covered most of these, but we, we might just tidy up and then see if there's anything left that we need to cover. And as we clarify these things, we will move them from want to learn. So if we already, uh, identified something if we already 
found the answer to something, we can just move it across and that means that it's covered. And we find this a good way to kind of address and reinforce uh, everything that's been discussed. In the, uh, and some additional questions came up as well. So you know, right. we can try and address those too. So, um, okay, uh, oops, somebody moved something in there. That's okay. So how to prevent this concerning children coming back to school? How can the school take precautions? So there, there's a couple of questions related to, to this as well. Um, some of these questions might be for you, some of them might be for me, so I, I, I might try and take this one, if that's okay. Sure. Yeah, go ahead, please. So, I, and it's a great question, and we've been, you know, I think we've been, we've been updating, but we'll continue to update our protocols and continue to update everyone. The school is taking precautions, you know, that we've, that we've shared uh, in terms of uh, isolation. Whenever there is a close contact, we have an isolation protocol that we've already shared with everyone. We have, of course, temperature checks in the morning for every single student. Um, we are close contact tracking whenever there is a case. We are masking, of course, on site. Uh, we have modified our building to, to make sure that there are fans for intake and outtake in every room. The doors are open in every room. Um, we took, I was talking to, uh, to Dr. Karina and Dr. Steve about this earlier. We spent some time using a CDC tool to calculate risk in every classroom. So there's, a, there's kind of a calculation tool which you can use to, based on the size of the room, based on the number of people in the room, based on your protocols like masking and distancing, based on your air circulation, based on the, the height of the ceiling, even all of these things factor in. And we used this tool in order to minimize the risk. Of course, that's not to say that there is ever a zero risk. Uh, I think, you know, Dr. Karina will also agree that there is always a risk involved. However, I believe that we are at a situation now where the risk of uh, of infection on site has been minimized to really to the, the minimum that it's possible to do in a school. So those are, those are just some of the precautions that we've taken on there. And I think we've also shared those a few times on the, uh, the irregular emails. Are five days enough to do a quarantine? And if you are still positive by the end of five days, is it safe and can't transmit to other people? I feel like you addressed that one in your session. Yeah. Um, if a person, uh, so on, on day five, uh, it's important uh, to monitor person's temperature, a child's temperature, because symptoms like uh, coughing or runny nose, they can still be persistent, right? Um, and if uh if coughing is still going on even uh, it's very common as well to still continue uh, even for a few weeks that's just um, the normal mechanism of our body to get rid of the remaining uh, viral particles uh, but if it's only coughing and uh, without any um, symptoms of fever uh, they can actually end uh, their isolation their isolation just make sure that uh, the fever has stopped and they do not develop any uh, difficulty breathing, uh, then they're safe enough to end uh, their five day of isolation. If you're still in doubt, it's better to talk to a doctor so that uh, the doctor uh, himself or herself can review the medical condition of your child so that you get reassurance uh, on whether it's um, logical or not to end the isolation. It is uh, something that is difficult to swallow, right? Um, uh, it, it, because it's so simple. Uh, but uh, that is what has what has been recommended by uh, by an association that have rigorously investigated on uh, the nature of this illness. And and for what it's worth, that is the same recommendation. Uh, yeah. Our our protocol at NGIS is a little bit stricter than that. Um, we have uh, for a positive case, we have 10 days uh, with uh, with five days symptom free. And uh, if somebody is completely asymptomatic with a positive case, 
they can return after five days, but we require a PCR test. So we're, we're a little bit stricter than, PC, than uh, CDC, and I, I think that's okay. Right. Yeah, that's all right. Yeah. Uh, it's also um, very important uh, addressing to the previous uh, question, how to prevent children from getting infected. I think every parent really needs to practice uh, the temperature measurement because if your your child has fever, a fever is a sign of um, uh, an infection that is ongoing. Uh, and uh, if, uh, if it is really an infection, a sign of fever means that they are highly contagious. So never send your child to school when they have fever or when in the morning you measure their temperature, it's more than 38 degrees Celsius or 100.4 Fahrenheit, they really need to stay home, regardless whether it is caused by COVID or not. I think we, we the whole sort of presentation was addressing this question of what to do in this new phase. And I think you also talked about the uh, the symptoms of it. So we can move that across. I think we've explained, I've just sort of answered the question about the school managing the healthy environment. Here's an interesting one. Um, is 2000 milligrams of vitamin C and 5000 milligrams of B3 recommended as a, uh, as a, uh, medicine, I guess, against COVID. Right. Is this, uh, th this means uh, the question is addressing to treatment for yes. someone who has contracted the infection, correct? I believe okay. that was the meaning of the question, yes. Right. There is no evidence-based data uh, to support the, that this treatment is effective in reducing uh, someone's chance developing severe symptoms however uh, they can receive this just as a supplement to fulfill their micronutrient level or to optimize their health but uh, currently we do not see any correlation between vitamin c and vi uh, vitamin d therapy to address uh, COVID, uh, to COVID specifically, um, but vitamin D is a very important micronutrient for uh, children's uh, bone health. So if there is deficiency, then they really need to get treated because it affects their growth. Maybe Dr. Steven, uh, you have an additional opinion in this? <laughs> You're on mute. You're on mute. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Well, you can hear me now. Yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, I think you know, in, in cases like this, it's also uh, common sense that is really important. So, if someone is suffering from a virus, any virus, uh, and in this case, uh, COVID, we have to make sure that that person is uh, boosting his or her own immunity system. So, uh, and if you're a parent, you just have to try your best to make sure that you, your, your child gets uh, healthy uh, yeah, nutrition, basically. And, and we know that vitamin C uh, can help in any virus or any flu, uh, but you don't have to overdo it, in my opinion. Um, because if, if, you, if you take a normal uh, portion of fruit, etc., uh, you know, you, you'll probably get uh, sufficient. But it is true that when you're not feeling so well, that probably your appetite might be affected. So that's why I'm not against taking any, any supplements. But I don't think you should panic about, okay, now I need to find uh, the, the right tablets with uh, the right uh, amount of uh, vitamin D. Um, you know, it, it, we know it, it, it can help you with respiratory uh, infections. So it's good if you take it, but you don't have to, um, you know, uh, uh, stress out about it if you don't have it in your house. Completely agree. Fantastic. Um, I think this is kind of part of the same previous question. What has the school done to modify the facilities and prepare? I think we've covered that one. 
now this is a this is an interesting one perhaps a borderline uh, decision again depending on each each family but yeah my kid already had the first vaccine a week ago can i send her to school or should we wait some time any suggestions Okay, uh, that's a good question uh, because uh, indeed uh, vaccines against COVID uh, take time uh, from the first time they're administered or injected. They do not work immediately like wonders to protect themselves. That's why when we come uh, to a vaccination facility, we always need to apply standard, uh, standard health protocols. Um, most of the vaccinations that are mRNA, mRNA vaccines, especially like Pfizer, uh, they start to kick in or uh, start to be protective at least one week after receiving uh, their, uh, their jab. So uh, if your child received um, an mRNA uh, vaccination, then they, uh, seven days is enough um, to uh, wait for the vaccination to be protective. Uh, for Sinovac, there are conflicting data, but the most uh, uh, reliable, I think, that I've read is two weeks uh, for it to work, even up to one month. Um, so, uh, so two weeks at least to wait if it was Sinovac. I didn't know that. That's, that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I feel, uh, Bukharina, you, you answered this one very clearly. What are the factors in deciding whether to send my child to school in terms of child preparedness, school preparedness, comorbidities, vaccination level, etc.? Yes. Um, and I believe you've, you've addressed this one as well. Is it safe for the school to allow positive cases to return after 10 days without a PCR? Your response? Yes, is it is safe and uh, please uh, know that the PCR can remain positive up to three months. It's not recommended anymore to do any PCR even after a person gets uh, infected up to three months, uh, uh, especially if they don't have symptoms. Really good information. Um, Wowzer, okay, this is a long one. Uh, it's a yeah, this is an interesting one. Uh, more, more aimed towards uh, older adults. Um, you can probably read, can you read that? Yes, yeah, it's clear. Uh, so I think this is actually a, a case, yeah, uh, that uh, is discussed. Um, so this person appears to have gejala ringan or mild symptoms um, and with a comorbidity because of hypertension, uh, of course, the, the medical condition of this uh, patient uh, needs to be discussed. Uh, whether they, they uh, uh, you know, have uh, comorbidities that are not under control and the, the use of antiviral medications as well, uh, this needs to be observed for any side effects. I hear a lot of people are taking them at home. Um, we do not encourage uh, the use of antivirals, especially if your symptoms are mild. Uh, the use of antiviral medications for COVID need to really be observed by the doctor who prescribes it. And that's why it's usually given at hospital settings and in people who have uh, severe symptoms. Uh, now, if a person with comorbidities and they no longer have symptoms after day 10 they can already end their isolation right uh, so i think that's the answer they do not need to do another antigen because i think uh, it says here they've they've done a uh, three times antigen swab but the pcr is still positive that has no value at all yeah so it uh, so we really need to look at the symptoms whether they're recovering well and the fact that they have already finished 10 days of isolation because this is someone with uh, high risk so it's better to extend the isolation to 10 days after 10 days they've recovered fully no need to do pcr they can already resume uh, their activities yeah I think that's such an important message. Yeah, the, uh, the the PCR is is good as a diagnostic tool at the start, but no longer uh, beneficial after the period. Yes, correct. 
how important, there's a couple of questions about boosters here. So yeah, how important is the booster? And kalau sudah booster, apakah nanti perlu booster 6 bulan kemudian dan setiap tahunnya ke depan? <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's a very heavy question. Maybe Dr. Stephen would like to make a research and investigation for the following years. Uh, the booster is very, very important. Uh, it's been identified that uh, our antibodies or our immune system uh, or immune cells that are specific to uh, protecting us against COVID, um, they start to wear down, they start to lower down after in approximately two to three months, depending on uh, what vaccines they have received. Um, that is why it's very important to get these levels um, increased again so to remain protected for a longer period of time uh, and uh, and because uh, the covid peaks are happening again you know a lot of people are getting infected that is why the boosters are currently very very important to protect you during the high peak of uh, covid rise and um, uh, please uh, also uh, uh, be aware of the regulation um, I think in Indonesia is it six months uh, Dr. Steven um, for the booster since the second dose if I'm not mistaken um, in other countries the regulations are different some some uh, actually give the boosters even uh, two months after the second dose of vaccination. So uh, whatever the regulations apply, please do the boosters because they're safe enough, especially if you've done primary vaccination, uh, you did not have side effects. It's unlikely that you're allergic already because you've received them. Um, and uh, yeah, I think I, I hope that that's already emphasizing how important the booster is. And uh, for the future um, dose or for the future scheduling of another booster, uh, there hasn't been any recommendation yet. It is likely that a person will need it again, like a flu vaccination that's given annually every year. Yeah, but this has not yet been established. Uh, we will have to wait for uh, the conclusions of research and uh, recommendations from the official um, communities, yeah. Uh, another good reason to get boosted is yesterday there was an announcement stating that uh, international travel quarantine will only be three days if you've had the booster. So right. health, health concerns aside, it's going to make travel a lot easier as well. Yeah, so for <laughs> logistics as well, then you require that. And yeah. actually some, some of my friends who were afraid of getting vaccinated, they had to get it just because just so they're able to travel so uh it's required everywhere now okay okay uh, really good question are there any specific food nutrients and vitamins i know dr steve was talking about fruit earlier uh in order to help build our immune system yeah uh when it's specific to our immune system uh, a balanced diet is basically um, the answer to that. Um, so encourage uh, your children or your uh, family members um, to have carbs, proteins uh, in their meals in equal portions, uh, hydration, uh, drinking enough water uh, is also important for our immune system, as well as maintaining physical activity or exercise. Yeah, that's also an important factor. Uh, it seems that mobility, being uh, physically active is also uh, protecting against, um, protective against uh, contracting uh, diseases. If uh, a person has, uh, has comorbidities like diabetes um, or hypertension, uh, these are uh, specific um nutritional requirements for example like uh you need to lower down on the carbs um or for people with high blood pressure they need to lower down uh salty intake and uh and yeah i, I think it uh, it needs to be customized to everyone's medical condition in that case but in general uh, equal portions of carbs foods vegetables Well, the worst
yes. it's important i think for people to to sort of be aware that just because you know something is possible it it, it doesn't mean that it's like it doesn't it doesn't mean that it, you know it's within sort of uh, uh statistical likelihood yeah yeah be aware of the, the those risks absolutely agree yeah just gives yeah. them an yeah Yes, yeah, also to, to, to give you all an idea is that since, uh, well, we, we had an episode of maybe 10 weeks that we didn't see any positive COVID cases in our clinic. And now we see them every day. Yeah? And, and, and it's, you know, can be four, can be five, can be more, but none. And we, we have a list of those patients who are uh, tested positive and uh, some of them have symptoms, but none of our patients are in hospital. None of them have required any special medication. Uh, so, which is good. And uh, usually after a few days, they, um, yeah, they, they start to feel better. And it's not that I'm saying it's not uh, dangerous and we, we still need to watch out uh, and we still need to monitor all those who are infected but uh, my, my point is that uh, yeah when, when you catch it or when you hear about someone having COVID um, it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, you know you, you have to rush into hospital uh, yeah that, that is basically my, my take home message yeah I guess there is a lot of stress fear and anxiety which is a normal thing in this case right because no one is actually prepared mentally especially for a pandemic uh, uh, like this and uh, and uh, if, if, if you're having fear and panic you're you're not alone um, many people are, ex are experiencing this and uh, it's important to address what you are concerned about and not ignore it actually that's why this talk is very important right uh, it's to address uh, the parents concerns the fear and your questions how to uh, be uh, you know uh, very uh, at maximum with protecting your children and yourself um, and to not you know to not be so uh, uh, fearful uh, and to have an idea about what's really happening uh, at our practice, right? Um, so, and and if uh, your child tests positive, uh, do not beat yourself up. It's not uh, a failure that you have uh, failed to protect your child. It's just natural for it to occur uh, in this situation where the infection rate is high. Um, and I'm, I think everyone is trying their best to protect their loved ones, yeah. And, and also it's important not to focus on, okay, what, what sort of medication should should you or your child take? Huh? Uh, and there are plenty of uh, uh, providers who are happy to uh, give you a standard package of all sorts of uh, medicine, including antiviral, antibiotics, etc. I would say, you know, try to identify someone, a medical professional that you you, you can easily access and, and talk about, you know, this is the case, these are the symptoms, or these are my fears, etc. And, you know, if you don't know it, try to find the answer, find a reliable source. And um, yeah, hopefully that can uh, guide you uh, through this whole process. I'd imagine sometimes uh, an over aggressive approach to mild symptoms could actually be more damaging than just, you know, having a, a slight fever and a headache and, and taking a paracetamol. Yes. Correct. Uh, runny noses. Now, this is this is actually something I, I talked to Dr. Steve about today. Because here's the thing: sometimes um, younger children. I, 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 I refer to my own experience when my kids were two or three years old. Sometimes younger children they have allergies. Sometimes their nose just runs for for weeks or months, and it doesn't necessarily mean that they're sick, but it could still be counted as a, a as a symptom. So yeah, well, what what is your what is your approach in the morning if a if a parent kind of looks at their kid and they've got a bit of a 
a bit of a something something, a bit of a runny nose going on. What, what would you suggest? Right, of course, with the current uh, high rate of infection, uh, or uh, depending as well on uh, a child's medical history, it's very common, for example, children go through um, allergy symptoms that, uh, that may present as just a, a, a mild runny nose. Uh, this also depends on, you know, whether they, they've been exposed to a, a case or not, right? Uh, but we always say uh, that if it's a new symptom and that there is an established uh, exposure to someone who was positive, there is no harm in um, trying, to, uh, trying to establish if it's a COVID uh, infection or not. So if you're in doubt, do the antigen test. It's relatively simple. Uh, with the current situation, we always think uh, it's COVID until it's proven not, right? Um, and if all is safe, uh, if they tested negative, there is no obvious exposure to the case, then they are safe enough to attend school un uh, unless they have fever or coughing. That means whatever the, the, the cause of uh, the symptoms um, can uh, likely be contagious, whether it's COVID or not, it can be any other viral infection. It can be bacterial infection as well. Uh, there are many other diseases other than COVID that can present with similar symptoms and also be contagious. Yeah, and, and another thing is, well, you, you, you know your child best, right? So if your child has a long history of uh, a runny nose in the morning and it's, it is transparent and clear what is uh, uh, being discharged from the nose, or if the, the, the person has a history of, you know, a, a, a mild cough or uh, maybe some asthma, as long as it's um, not out of the, uh, uh, no, sorry, as long as it's uh, a common or a, his or her usual symptoms, it should be all right. You should become more alert or alarmed if, uh, the symptoms are different, right? So if the, if the symptom is a runny nose, but let's say the, the color of the discharge is different or the uh, amount of times that he or she needs to uh, blow uh, their nose is different. So as soon as you notice a difference in symptoms, you have to be a bit more alert. But if it's, yeah, like his or her normal self, uh, yeah, you, you don't have to uh, immediately uh, do testing or take other measures. And we, we, would, we would ask parents also, so if in the morning your child does have a runny nose and this is quite common for them, um, you know, frequent allergies and so forth, um, please do just maybe send a message to the, to the teacher in the morning and explain that as well. So the teacher might not be entirely as familiar with your child's medical norms as, as you are. So just give them a heads up so they don't uh, panic when they, when they see your child arrives. Absolutely. I think at times like this, it's very crucial that uh, there is a maintained communication between parents and the school staff and medical staff um, because I, uh, you know, I think it's easier uh, to make them safer if teachers are aware of what's happening and pa parents are also uh, free to communicate uh, their concerns with whatever that's happening at school, yeah? Okay, here's an interesting one. Is there any brand of antigen, like home antigen test, that seems to be more accurate than the others? E.g., you see, you know, the lung, lung gene seems to be oh. the brand new. <laughs> Brands no. are being mentioned, no. Dr. Stephen. <laughs> All right. No, well, um, of course, we uh, we we encourage uh, doing the antigen tests, looking at the pamphlets. They all have different uh, sensitivity and specificity. But it also, other than the you know the brands, it comes down to how you do the test. Is it done properly in, in the right method, in the right timing as well? Uh, as I've said, if you have no symptoms, 
um, you just simply uh, after after getting uh, exposed to someone who's positive better wait first until five days um, but I mean regarding to brands what do you think Dr. Steven? You're muted at the moment. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I, I know I can only speak for good practice that we only go for well established brands with uh, an excellent uh, track record. Um, but people, I mean, it's, it's not up to me to uh, promote any specific brand, but it is really important also that the swap taker uh, does, a, does a good job. You know, when you mentioned earlier about, for instance, the, the value uh, that people uh, uh, place in CT values. Yeah, if, if, if someone who, who takes a swab only uh, swaps in such a way that uh, the viral material is very little on the swab, yeah, then you get like a very high CT value. But if someone swaps really well or just in a in a certain corner or angle that there's lots of viral material, the CT's value uh, yeah, become much lower. So that is, uh, yeah, you know, it also depends on how it is transported to the lab. Well, this is for PCR then. But for antigen testing, yeah, I would say, well, we're relatively uh, a little bit more expensive, but we use an expensive kit that has proven to be, uh, you know, ha having good specific specificity and sensitivity. And uh, yeah, I, I, I find the more, uh, the more established the brand, the more likely it is that it, it, it will be a, a, a good kit. But that's, um, yeah. Yeah, but bottom line is whatever brand a person is using, it's, uh, it really depends on the method and the timing of the use of uh, the kit itself. Yeah. And also don't, don't read the antigen test too long after the actual test. Huh? I, I also heard from a patient who said, yeah, I tested this morning uh, negative and then after three hours, they said, oh, there's an extra line visible. Now you're positive. <laughs> yeah. That's not how it works. That's not how it works. So the reading takes place after uh, 15 minutes, but please read the, 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 the kit, the manual properly. And it's, I think the only, the, the uh, range of time of reading is between 15 to 30 minutes. Uh, generally, for, generally for all antigen kits. Longer than that, it's uh, it's not reliable anymore. Uh, you just have to throw it away. Okay, I'll um, I, we'll go through the last couple of questions quickly because I realize we've run a little bit over time, but I think it has been very cons constructive. I think we've answered the question of when you're okay to to leave isolation after having a positive COVID uh, nineteen test. Um, this is a more of a, perhaps more of a philosophical question. Will we be wearing masks forever? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that's a very difficult question. Yeah. Um, uh, I cannot really predict how the, the pandemic will unfold uh, until the end of our time. Uh, but like all pandemics in the past, they've, uh, we, we learn from history um they can end uh but it's in our uh you know control as well uh that um we we are able to reach that phase where it will not be needed anymore um there is a, a possible chance that we don't have to wear it uh anymore so i hope we do get to that phase I think the, the previous question was in Indonesian. I just want to make sure uh, they understand. So I'll just answer in Bahasa. Uh, kalau sudah pernah uh, kena COVID sebelumnya, terutama dalam tiga bulan terakhir, uh, sebenarnya uh, masih tetap harus uh, menggunakan masker, cuci tangan, menjaga jarak, itu semua. Uh, jadi keamanan uh, perlu dipertimbangkan Uh, dalam hal tersebut karena 
Ko, uh, ini kan kita belajar dari varian yang baru ya. Varian yang baru ini uh, sudah mengakibatkan reinfeksi. Artinya uh, yang sebelumnya pernah COVID, sekarang kena COVID lagi karena ada varian baru. Jadi kalau sudah pernah kena COVID uh, uh, dan uh, saat ini berjalan-jalan tanpa uh, uh, apa um, menerapkan Uh, protokol standar kesehatan tentunya belum aman sama sekali karena kita tidak bisa prediksi apakah akan ada gelombang covid lagi yang uh, muncul jadi tentunya uh, kalau kita bilang aman padahal kita udah pernah kena covid itu sedikit um, ini ya terlalu cepat mengambil kesimpulan kita tetap harus berhati-hati uh, tapi tentunya kita masih bisa we can still enjoy our time doing something um, In, in the middle of this pandemic, yeah. Right, just two more questions. The last one, uh, second from last, is should I still get the booster if I already caught COVID recently? I think I think there's probably a, a limit here of how many months after infection and recovery you should take. Yes, you should. You should get the booster. In Indonesia, the booster can be received within one month since you tested positive. Uh, this is also uh, uh, considering if you if you if you're fully recovered on the day of the vaccination you do not have fever uh, or any acute infection and that your comorbidities are, are under uh, control. So you should get the booster even if you have been infected. Fantastic. And the last question was for me I think which is uh, what percentage of NGIS uh, teachers are vaccinated. The answer is 100% of NGS teachers are vaccinated, and uh, we are we are at a majority of expatriate te- uh, sorry a majority of boosters at the moment as well. So we're we're almost there with boosters for everyone too. Uh, some difficulties getting expatriates boosters, but we're we're working around those, and we're we're almost at full booster vaccination now. Okay, well. Once again, we're we're so happy to have your professional support, to have your partnership in these rapidly changing times. Uh, on a, as 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 a family, as a, as a school, we strongly recommend uh, reaching out to Good Practice as a as an international GP here in Jakarta. And on behalf of everyone who's taken the time today, firstly thank everyone who's who's joined, and a huge thank you to Dr. Karina and Dr. Steve for sharing your time, sharing your insight and helping put all of our minds at rest here today. Thank you so much.